you, Pastor Matt. Let's give Jesus a hand. Amen? He's so worthy of all the praise. Hey, uh, you can have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Uh, I wouldn't be here and wouldn't be the person I am if it wasn't for my wife, Mandy. She's right here, yes, right here on the front row. I tease everybody, so um, I'm going to go a little old school right now, but if you've never seen the movie La Bamba, I don't know what's wrong with you. But I've always said every Richie's got to have his Donna, so there's my Donna right there, yes. She just don't like it when I call her kitten, but um, you'd have to watch the movie to understand that, but anyway. So uh, we're so honored to be here today, and coming to uh, Fountain Church, I always like to thank Pastor Matt and Pastor Jackie uh, for having us, but what we found out is um, I didn't know Jackie's maiden last name was Martinez, and what she didn't know is my mom's the Martinez. That's my prima now, so I mean, we're somewhat cousins, as most Mexicans are related in some way, shape, or form, but uh, we were laughing about that, but I was teasing Pastor Matt. I said, Pastor Matt, that was really nice of you to get this large screen so we can now watch Raider games. Would you like me more if I said Niner games? Okay, it's 50-50. Okay, okay. But no, it's always such an honor and such a pleasure to be here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity uh, to be in your house. Lord, I just pray that as you speak to me, speak through me for the blessing and the benefit of your people. In Jesus' name, we all said. Amen, amen. amen. Always an honor. Can I ask one favor, Pastor Matt? Can, can we get a little bit more of the house lights on? I like to see people. I want to see people, yes. Uh, I was thinking about something. It's, it's always an honor and a privilege to come here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually just from right over the hill. Uh, I'm a Stockton native, 209. That's right. I survived Stockton is the shirt I have made for myself. But um, it is my hometown. It's where my family still is. And so uh, it's always an honor and a privilege to come out over here. And uh, my church is in Fresno. And I'm going to tell you all about it here in just a little bit. But I realize that we've all come out of the various things, right? So we, Pastor Matt was saying we came out of COVID and we might be going right back in. We don't know. I guess the jury's out now what's going on. And, and there was a familiar phrase. There was a familiar phrase that people were using. And they were talking about, hey, we're all in this together. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat, right? And, 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 and I just wanted to say something that hit me the other day. It's like, um, we're in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. Some people are in a yacht, and I'm over here in a raft. You know what I mean? Does that, does that make sense? So some people are doing really well, and I'm over here struggling. And so what happened was I began to just read my Bible in, in just a different light in the midst of COVID and some stuff that was happening. And there was something that really hit me. Um, I think the expression is like a ton of bricks, right? And this is what hit me. No matter what's going on, no matter what season you're in, the great commission of God never stops. The great commission never turns into the great suggestion. Jesus never suggests you share your faith. He commands it. Matter of fact, twice, twice between Matthew and then the book of Acts, he gives you a command, go preach the gospel, go preach the gospel. Matter of fact, we call it the good news. And there's a reason why he asks us to go preach the gospel, and that's because there's hurt people out there. There are people who are really, really struggling through a season. And I want to show you a passage of text, right? And this is found in the book of Isaiah. I'm going to show you this passage. It's in the passage translation. And I believe it's more relevant today than it ever has been. And the passage translation is a different type of translation. But it's come up on the board. And it says this. Listen, are you thirsty for more? Come to the refreshing waters and drink. Even if you have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come and buy all the wine and milk you desire. It will not cost you a thing. Why spend your hard-earned money on something that cannot nourish you or work so hard for something that will not satisfy? So listen carefully to me, and you'll enjoy all the sumptuous feasts, delighting in the feast of food, of the finest of food, excuse me. Pay attention to come close to me and hear that your total being may flourish. And I love this call because it's always a call to those who are hungry and those who are thirsty. Now, I live in Fresno, and we are seeing, I think this is our eighth consecutive day of over 100 degrees. Just three weeks ago, we topped out at 118. Oh, it was hell. I ain't going to lie to you. That was nasty. Uh, the lowest they got down to was 83 degrees. Do you know what it's like to wake up in, in, in 5, 6 in the morning, you walk outside, it's 83 degrees already? You're like, why is Satan breathing on me, right? It's like, I mean, that's the real deal. And so you realize, like, that's really hot. And so no matter how much water you drink, you're always thirsty. 
It's like you can't drink enough. And so th- th- I love this. I love this imagery here. He's trying to tell people, listen, you're going to find something and you're going to think it satisfies the soul, but you're going to find out it leaves you wanting more. And if anything, what we've seen is you could throw all the money you want at something and people are still searching for something greater. Man, you know, you know people were looking for money when they started making stimmy TikTok videos, right, about the stimulus checks. Like, oh, my gosh. And then it came and it went and people were still in the same condition. You got people, you know, hooking up during COVID thinking this would be the one and then it came and it went and they're still in the same condition. So this thing starts to ring true that you don't even know what you're looking for. But Jesus is still calling. He says, come if you're thirsty. Come if you're hungry. Come if you still desire these things. I will satisfy your soul. Why? Because even in the midst of a pandemic, we've come to realize that the only thing that satisfies is Jesus Christ. But it concerns me because the church is somewhat fallen asleep. We've fallen asleep and we forgot all about this great commission, that there are people who are still dying, they're still hurting, they're still lost, but we've fallen asleep. We've almost, um, we've almost become like this. About 30 years ago, um, there, was, there was these weightlifters on this, um, on, this, on this afternoon show. I won't tell you what the show is, but they were on this afternoon show and And they were showing off all their muscles, and they were shredded. They were ripped. I mean, they had muscles on their ears. They had so many muscles. I mean, it was impressive. And so the guy says to him, and he says a very practical question, so what are they for? And the guy goes, they're for this. And bam, like muscle popped out. And they're for this. And he actually had abs. I don't have abs. I'm round. And so he showed his abs. And the guy goes, no, what is it for? Like, what do you use it for? He goes, it's for this. And bam, and he's doing all And that's the church. What are you for? We're for great worship and we're for this. It's not what Jesus said. He said, you're to be salt and you're to be light. Did you know 30 times in the New Testament, Jesus talks about the good news? 30 times. Elion, the good news. Matter of fact, let's look at a couple of them just so we get kind of a reference. He said, Jesus replied, go back and tell John's disciples. Go back and tell John, look at this, what you see in what you hear. So the gospel is to be demonstrated. It's not to be kept quiet. It's to be demonstrated. What you see and what you hear. Look at this list real quickly. Let's look. Okay, I can't make this up. It's in red. Jesus' words. The blind receive sight. The lame walk on those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. This is what you see and this is what you hear. Let's look at some more. Mark chapter 115. The time has come. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and believe in the what? Good news. How about this one? Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only amongst Jews. Okay, so they were excluding people. Verse 20, some of them, however, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news. So real quickly, who's the good news for? Everybody. It's not just for the people you like. It's also for the people you don't like. Hello? Now, here's what I find interesting. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, but let's not, let's, we're in church now, so keep it PG. Okay, we're in church. But I, I want you to think about what were you doing the night before you got saved? I was in last service, and immediately someone responded. It was hilarious. I said, what were you doing the night before you got saved? Like, ooh, all bad. I'm like, okay, what were you doing now that you said that out loud? Like, what were you doing? But what were you doing? Like, it hits me. My wife and I were driving um, up from Fresno yesterday, and, and it just hits me. It's like, do you know that the gospel, when it is preached to you and when you make a decision, you never see it coming? Like, you don't plan it. I've never anybody said, I plan on this Sunday giving my heart to the Lord. You just wait and see, but I'm planning on it. It usually comes and just smacks you right in the face and you make a decision that you don't even know why you're making the decision and all of a sudden things change. It's like the woman at the well never knew her life was going to change by noon the next day. Because I think had she known it was going to change, she might not have shown up to draw water. But all of a sudden she runs into Jesus and Jesus says to her, hey, I want you to go call your husband. She goes, I ain't got one. He goes, well, you ain't lying about that. You got five and the one you're living with ain't your boo. Could you imagine if you do that now? You're just trying to go to Walmart, and you're, you're there you're talking to the checker. 
Hey, I feel like God wants me to tell you, go call your husband. Why ain't God want you right, girl? Because you done had six. <laughs> That's funny and scary all at the same time. Because where I'm from, she might cut you. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's where I'm from. I don't know. <laughs> that's true, though, huh? Okay, anyway, so I, I digress. But my point is, you never know. Nicodemus, or excuse me, Zacchaeus never knew it was coming. I've been to Jericho. I've been to, I've been to Israel. I've been to Jericho. I've been to the tree. The tree is still around. The same tree that Zacchaeus went up into. And what's nuts is, it's like the dude got up one day. He never knew it was coming. Going about his business, all of a sudden, he hears Jesus is coming into town. He's so desperate. He's so thirsty. He's so hungry to meet Jesus. He climbs up in a tree. And next thing you know, Jesus calls him out and says, hey, I'm going to lunch at your house. Does anybody here work, if your boss is here, don't raise your hand, but if your boss ain't here, raise your hand. Anybody work for somebody like a boss who you thought, man, I know they don't love Jesus and they probably won't ever, just, it's, it's okay, you're safe. Just anybody want to, thank you. One person will admit their boss is the half-brother of Satan. That's good, okay. So what I, I want you to understand, that's like Jesus coming into town and he picks your boss to go to his house to have lunch. You know you're gossiping about Jesus. Don't act holy. Like, what type of Messiah is this? He going to his house. Crazy, right? But Zacchaeus changes instantaneously. And I'm going to share a little bit about my story. I never saw it coming. So can I simply say it to you this way? Sometimes the good news you're preaching isn't good news. It's actually bad news. You know, I didn't grow up in church. And when I wasn't in church, I didn't want nobody to preach to me about church. You can keep your Jesus. Because I wanted to sin. I was having fun sinning. Like, I was an A-plus sinner. You know what I mean? Like, people would come, go to church. Why do I want to go to church? Don't invite me to church. I don't want to go to church. Are there cute girls at church? Maybe I'll go to church. I didn't want to go to church. And so I didn't want anybody messing with me. And I didn't want anybody preaching at me. And I quoted the great theologian Tupac, and I told him, only God can judge me, so leave me alone. <laughs> Y'all didn't know he was a theologian? Okay, well, I just told that. Okay, maybe he's not, but it just made sense. But the point is, I didn't want nobody judging me. And so I'm like, I'm not going. And so you got to understand that there are times that we think we're giving people the good news, and it's really kind of bad news. And if you don't believe me, I always go to the Bible, and i got to throw a quick disclaimer. I'm going to tell you a story here in just a minute where I'm actually living in a 21st century Acts chapter 16 moment, and I'll prove it to you. Acts 19, excuse me. Acts 19 in the pastor's translation reads this. At that time, major disturbances erupted in Ephesus over the people following God's ways. That's Christians, right? It began with a wealthy man named Demetrius who had built a large business and enriched many craftsmen by manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek god, goddess Artemis. Demetrius called a meeting of his employees along with the various tradespeople of Ephesus, and he said, do you know that our prosperous livelihood is being threatened by Paul, who is persuading crowds of people to turn away from our gods? How many of you know when you start messing with people's money, it's about to get heated? How many of you know that? Like, you can do a lot of things, but you start messing with my money, we're going to have a conversation. Go ahead and wave at me. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, let your, let your employer rob you of five hours. Mm-hmm. He getting an email, phone call, and a house visit. COVID or no COVID. We, we getting in close contact. Okay, praise the Lord. Here we go. He says this. He goes, hey, we make a good living by doing what we do, but everywhere Paul goes, not only here in Ephesus, but throughout Western Turkey, he convinces people that there's no such thing of a God made with hands. Our businesses are in danger of being discredited, and not only that, but the temple of our goddess Artemis is being dishonored and seen as worthless. Picture with me if you could. This was the main source of money in Ephesus. Everything was built around this shrine, this temple, where they believe Artemis fell from heaven and was to be worshipped. So all the idols you bought were of her, of this statue. And so all the money to be made was being made right there. And here comes Paul with the good news, and he's turned the whole city upside down. There's a revival breaking out, right? There's a revival breaking out. And this guy goes, if we don't shut him up, he's going to shut us down. Now I'm going to tell you a story. It's a true story. Pastor Matt talked about being protested. Right now, as you sit in church, right here, right now, at my church in the Tower District, 
I have these people out there protesting me right now. Go ahead and show that picture. That's right now as we speak. 30 weeks, seven months, two weeks, 30 weeks. Sometimes it's three, 400 people out there. And every week my church has to walk by people protesting us. And here's the number one thing they protest. Anthony Flores and Adventure Church will literally shut down this community if we allow a church to be there. I said, well, how do you shut it down? Because that district is known for its bars and for the four pot dispensaries that they want to put on every corner. And they're afraid little old me and the gospel I preach is going to shut them down. So you don't got to do this now. You don't got to do this now. But if you think I'm lying, go ahead and Google my name, Adventure Church, Fresno, California, Anthony Flores, and be prepared for what you read. The New York Post, the L.A. Times, every, every newspaper outlet in Fresno, everybody's followed me. I mean, it's like a paparazzi on Sundays. They're trying to get my picture and trying to get me to say something. 30 weeks, seven and a half months. I've talked to all my pastor friends across the nation. They said to date, I have the longest running protest against any church they've ever seen. And they're all just trying to cripple me financially. They're literally trying to bankrupt me. But they can't stop God. And their number one complaint is he will shut it down if we allow him to have a church there. And then the people say, but he will shut the bars down if we allow him to have a church there. So I had to go on TV. I went on TV. Uh, matter of fact, I'll be hosting a radio show next week and I'll be on TV again. But I had to go on TV and in front of a panel, I literally told everybody, you can open up all the pot dispensaries you want. I will never protest a thing. You can open up all the clubs you want and I'll never protest a thing because greater is he that lives on the inside of me than he that is financing those people. I'm not afraid of anything. You can put them next door, across the street. You can line the whole street with them. I am not afraid of what it's going to do because I know the God in whom I serve. So bring it on. You want to dispense dope? I want to dispense hope. We'll see who wins at the end of the day. So they blasted me. They literally ran my name through the mud. They, the mud. they doxed my wife and I. They doxed my kids. They told people to drive by my house. They said, go drive by that. Uh, well, the, well, I can't say what they said. But go drive by his house. So I went on TV. My wife got mad at this. But I went on TV. I sent her away. I went on TV and I said, Here's my address. The garage door is up. Please come by and say hi. I called your bluff. Bring it. Hey, y'all, I'm from Stockton, y'all. I don't know what to say, okay? Stockton slap for all you UFC fans. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I said, garage door is up. Come through. I'm waiting because I know the God in whom I serve. I know I'm protected. I know where I'm going when I die tonight. I ain't tripping. But I've watched this play out, and it's not good news to them. So then a person decides to sue the theater and myself. So I've been in court now for seven months. And I told this person he owns a brewery. I said, what are you so afraid of? You make beer and my Jesus turns water into wine. It's no competition. One's wine, one's beer. <laughs> you know, can I tell you something funny? Can I tell you something really funny? I'm going to give you a secret to life. The number one thing you can ask my wife. The number one thing that makes people most angry is they can't steal my joy. They hate my smile. They literally make signs. Every week they'll make a sign. Every week they'll make a sign for me, and it'll be one just for me. And then every week I judge their sign. Like I'll hold up a number like, hey, dude, that was like a three, bro. You suck. Like, come on. And then one time I came out here like three weeks ago. And the lady, she made this really cool sign. She said, hey, not loving your neighbor is kind of like going to the gym and skipping leg day. How dare you bring the gym into this conversation? Look at my legs. Those, I do not skip leg day. Forget you. I was so mad. My assistant pastor, Deshaun, goes, hey, that's a good one, though, pastor. That one's good. That took some creative thought. <laughs> And so what, they, they're mad because they can't rob my joy. They can't steal my joy. Because my joy is not given to me from the world. My joy is given to me from Jesus Christ. So the world didn't give it, so the world can't take it away. They can't wipe the smile off the face. I know my God is going to win. So you got to catch this. It's not good news, though, to them. 
And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Don't tell nobody. It's not good news because you're confronting them and the sin they're in. And don't nobody want to hear it. Don't nobody want to, don't nobody want to hear you got to wait, but you know, wait till you're married to have sex. Don't nobody want to hear that. Everybody wants to test drive the car before they purchase. Come on, think of the world we're living in. Don't nobody want to hear about that. Don't nobody want to hear about Christian biblical base values. No, everybody want to go smoke a blunt and forget about life's problems. Can't you smoke weed and be a Christian? No. God will not compete, okay? He's not going to compete for your affections. See, people don't want to hear it, so you walking in confronts them. Some people are just convicted by the way you serve Jesus. I walk in the room, sometimes I don't even got to say anything. And people get convicted. Why? Because it's not good news. Can I tell you something? It wasn't good news for me either. I didn't want to hear her sleeping with my girlfriend was wrong. You're wrong. And I would never say show me in the Bible because I knew they could show me in the Bible. I don't want to see it in the Bible. I don't want that Bible. I wanted to justify the way I was living. So it's not always good news. Or is it? It's only good news to people who are searching, who are desperate. Can, can, can I just show you a visual of what I'm, what I'm talking about real quick? Thank you, honey. Yeah, so um, I have here a good piece of steak. And I'm telling you right now, that's a good piece of steak. And I don't know about you guys, but anybody here likes salt? Who's salt? Where's my salt people at? Yes. Told somebody the other day, so for those that don't know, I'm Mexican. But I told somebody the other day, I tell you something, if they did an autopsy on me right now, I only consist of three things. Salt, sugar, and menteca. That's it. I mean, you cut me open. Salt, sugar, and grease. That's what I said. Just, I mean... I go, like we, like, we get into a fight. Like, we don't fight often, but we go for the chips and salsa. I'm like, you touch them chips, I will smack your hand. You got to put salt on them chips first. And you got to put salt in the salsa. And you got to salt it when it's going in your mouth. Anyway, so salt, the Bible says that you are salt and light. And, and really, you know, if you're going to get your steak ready, you got to salt that mug up a little bit. Ooh, yeah, that's good. Then if, if I didn't have to use my hands, you got to rub it in. And then for those of you who really know how to grill, where are my barbecuers at? You really know how to grill? Have me over. I'll, let the, I'll be the judge, okay? But have me over. But, but you talk to that meat like, mmm, in three hours. Ooh, okay. But, but did you know that salt literally just draws out the flavor? That's why you can put salt on fruit. Mmm, tahine, salt, lime. Ooh, who's taking me to lunch? Salt, the Bible says, I love it in the message translation, that when you add salt to people, it draws out the flavors in them, the God flavors. And, 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 and I'm just, I'm thinking about, man, what, what, it, it, what is it like for us to add salt? Well, you know, to add salt to people means we're adding value to people. And people respond to that value we're adding. Um, it sounds a lot like Galatians 5.22. And the fruit of the Spirit. By walking in love, gentleness, kindness, long-suffering, by walking in this fruit of the Spirit, we are drawing, we are drawing the God flavors out of people. I'll prove it to you. Go a whole week with just being kind to people, and you'll see how people respond. People are not used to kindness anymore. You you know, act like you're going to take the parking spot and then wave the next person to take it. Hey, don't worry, I'll walk today. Don't worry about it, but you can have that spot. Hey, you know what? Go ahead and open that door. And just let people walk in and just see how people respond. I, 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 anybody want to be bold? Let's make a bold step. Go out and pay for somebody's lunch. Well, why are you being so kind? Because God's kindness led me to repentance. That's why. And you're going to see you're drawing the flavors out in people. So when we add the right amount of salt, we're adding value to people. And they, in fact, return. And, and they, excuse me, they respond by intrigue, they respond by saying, I want to hear more about this Jesus whom you serve. Now watch this, watch this. If you put more salt on it, and I know you're thinking, what's he doing? Um, actually, if you work this in and you heat it up to a certain degree, this is actually how you make jerky. Old school, you would put it out in the heat and you would wrap it up and you would just let it dry out because of the salt that's in it. And this would carry you through the winter months when you couldn't cook anything. So in essence, this preserves. 
I call that walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. You may feel like you're going to Walmart for milk, but God is sending you to Walmart to witness to the person. And you're able to give a prophetic word. And that prophetic word creates a heart change and a transformation change, a literal life change. I remember, true story, this was the freakiest thing I've ever had happen to me uh, when it comes to the interaction with people. I was witnessing to this guy. He was a young man. Ooh, at that time, I think he was only about 23 or 24. And I literally went to three different stores, and the last one was Home Depot. I saw him at all three stores. And I looked at her, and I go, that's it. God, I get it. I'm sorry for the last two times. I'm hard-headed, but I ain't that hard-headed. Now, what you don't know is I'd been witnessing to him since him and I were at the same gym. He had come a couple times to church, and I didn't know at that time he was in a bad way. And so finally, the third time at Home Depot, I'm like, dude, you need to come to church. My gosh, three times in a row. Dude, you, I don't know if you're going to die tonight or nothing, but that's just weird. And he goes, yeah, pastor, that is weird. I've seen you everywhere I go now. Don't follow me home. I'm like, well, I didn't think about following you home, but we actually lived like two miles from each other. It was really weird, too. I didn't even know that. It's just weird. And what happens? He gets saved. He meets somebody, and I just did his wedding. Like, it's crazy. It's like, God, you may think you're going to go buy flooring, and God's going, no, I got, I got a supernatural experience for you because you're walking in this way. You are preserving them for what is to come. You're preserving. But hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Then, there, then there's just sometimes, just sometimes. Man, we just come on strong. <laughs> and you went from flavoring to preserving to ruining. Can we bring the picture up of my, my, my family, please? This is me and the kids and my wife. There we are in Hawaii. Aloha. Yes, it was so much fun. 20, 19, and 16, and I love them to pieces. Yes, ah, they're my children, but sometimes I want to give them back to Jesus. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it's like, really? You need a visual example of how to clean your room at 19? Really? I need to hold your hand in this moment? Come on. Okay. And I realized that there have been times that, mm, I'm going to make a bold confession. And if you want to join in, it's good. We'll all be in therapy together. I'm a control freak. <laughs> Nobody else wants to join in with me. I'm, I feel liberated. Okay, three, four of us. Okay. The rest of you must be saints. I don't know why I'm preaching. <laughs> and when it, comes to, when it comes to my kids, like one of them just decided, hey, like I got to start praying about who my spouse is going to be. No, you don't need to. You don't need to pray about that. Yeah, I, I just need to see, you know, she read this book by Dr. Henry Cloud and, you know, how to interview. And she goes, I need to go on a couple of interviews. No, you don't. God's going to speak to me and I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I saw it now. sound all spiritual. He will, an he will call and I will answer. Yes, Lord. He's saying it's no right now. <laughs> no. In, in a nice British accent, no. <laughs> no scrub for you. Anyway, so... I, I like to control things, and, 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 and I get it, and sometimes my kids are like, that's too much. I think this generation calls it extra. Dad, you're extra. And I'm like, extra loud? <laughs> and they go, you're, you're, you're over-salting. You're ruining this. You know, I think there's some of you here, you don't want your parents' faith, and I commend you for that. But at the exclusion of you don't want your parents' faith, don't go to the other end and have no faith at all. You didn't catch that. Don't exclude your parents' faith by having no faith at all. You need to hear that. Because your parents' faith carried them through a tough time you know none about. You ain't as grown as you think you are. You got to hear that. When mom and dad say, hey, I've been around the block, and I got the scars to prove it, they ain't lying. It's one thing I try to tell my kids, like, hey, I know a thing or two. Does this make sense? But mom, dad, we got to be careful. We don't ruin it. Because the number one goal is for us to help them hear the voice of Jesus and respond. You see that? I'm talking to the parents out here. I know it's hard. I know it's hard, right? So we don't want to ruin we want to bring out the flavors. We want to be so, we want, we, we want to be so just, what's the word I'm looking for? We, we want it to look so attractive that they're going, why is their life different? 
They seem happy. Even all hell breaking loose, they're still happy. I want that. And that's what we're doing. But I know there's a knee-jerk reaction to come on strong. I want to I wanna take a quick right turn real quick. And I'm going to show you something that I promise you is not only in your Bible, but it's, it's just different. Can I show you something? I'm going to come up with this quote. And, and I don't know if you're going to agree with this or not, but it is the Bible, and I'm going to show it to you, so you're probably going to have to agree with it, okay? I'm just warning you. Here's the statement, and it's even hard for me to say, but here's the statement. Hell has what the church needs. Do you see that? Now, I live in Fresno. I'm here to tell you hell ain't got nothing. Let me tell you right now. That's hot. Like, I, I, like we got black interior on a dark gray car in 118 setting on the sun. That'll get you praying in tongues when you open up the, it's like opening up an oven when you try to get, ooh, right? Thank you, Lord, I'm going to heaven. So even saying this is like just strange. The other day it was so hot, a person put a crock pot on the black asphalt and was expecting the meat to cook. I took a picture and I said, only in the hood could you put it out on the street and expect you to get some carne asada, you know what I'm saying? That's how hot it was. But actually, I think it'll work, actually, when we thought about it. But hell has what the church needs. There's this um, urgency, like time is short. Can can I show you the verse? Can okay? This is gonna come up on the board. It's in Luke chapter 16. There's a little bit before this and a little bit after, but let me just give you the middle of it, right? Abraham, right? Abraham's bosom. There's a rich man. There's Lazarus, and Lazarus is in heaven, and the rich man's in hell. And and then he tells Lazarus, he goes, "Hey, uh, I beg you." Then, uh, Father Abraham, um, would you send Lazarus to my father's house? Look at, look, 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 look. For I have five brothers, five brothers to warn so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Look at the response. Look at the response. There's an urgency. Look at the response. But Abraham says they have Moses and the prophets. Listen to them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead will go to them, they will repent. He is literally pleading his case before Father Abraham saying, you need to send somebody back. You need to go tell my brothers. You need to go warn them. If you could only see the amount of exclamation points, all caps highlighted, sticking out to you, that there's this urgency that there is an afterlife to the life you're living right now. And if you're not careful, something's going to happen. There's this urgency. So I only got two, two things to take away. I just want to give them to you. It's really super simple. I'm a simple preacher, and here it is. Who are your five people? I'm just sticking with the Bible verse. Don't get mad at me. You say, I got five. And no, I don't got five on it, okay? I got five people. <laughs> so I have to be careful, you heathens out there thinking things. Five people, right? I got five people. Who are your five? Number two, just from the text, only from the text, I'm not reading into it, how urgent are you? How urgent? How much of a priority is it for you? That's all I have. And it's good to sit in that because I'm going to share a story with you. How urgent it is. So the title of this message was LBJ's Good News. And the LBJ stands for stands for three different people. And the first person I want to tell you about, his name was Billy. His name was Billy. Billy, 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 Billy. You don't know Billy. I don't even know Billy. I think I met him one time, maybe. I don't know. I don't think I know him. But this dude named Billy, I owe him so much. You know, I said, you never know when your life will change. You never see it coming and your life changes, right? So this guy named Billy would go to school every day and he'd witness and he'd invite this beautiful, oxider, fine, hot woman to youth group all the time, 14 years old. He would always invite her. Little did he know this same young girl, her mom gave her heart to the Lord. Her mom did about a month before that and was pressuring and telling this 14-year-old, go to church with me, go to church with me. But this 14-year-old was stubborn and hard-headed, but this guy named Billy kept inviting, kept inviting. So from home to school, she was getting this invite. So one day she said, yes, and that woman is my wife. Billy, 
witness to my wife. And I'm so thankful to Billy. I'm thankful for two things. Number one, I'm thankful he invited her, and I'm thankful he didn't have enough game to keep her. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Woo! That was cold, huh? That was cold, huh? That was cold. Bad pastor. Bad pastor. Bad pastor. <laughs> You know, from that moment on, she started praying for her husband. She'll tell you that. I know she looks sweet and innocent now, but she was stubborn. She was hard. She was rebellious. She was super rebellious. Just throwing that out there. And uh, I'm so thankful. Then uh, the J. The J stands for this man named John. Come on up. You want to play? Yeah. The worship team. John, uh, (laughs) I got to, I hate to even say this, but um, my best friend's name was John and his dad was Big John. And is God is my witness, hand on Bible, I would have never let my kids hang out with a person like me. I got his son into so much trouble. Y'all have that one friend who you just say, hey, I think we should do this, and they do it? I was the guy who did it. It's like we lit firecrackers off in my room, caught my room on fire. I mean, just stupid, stupid stuff. I was just that guy. I was like, let's go have fun, forget the consequences. Hey, let's jump off a bridge. Let's go. And so I don't know why he ever let me. They're they're the most God-fearing, God-loving family I've ever met, John and Miss Monica. And I never knew March of 93 my life was going to change, and it changed drastically. Check this out. I cannot make this up. I literally, literally uh, took my three best friends, and we were going to go to my dad's house in L.A., and we were going to go party all week. We were jumping on an Amtrak train. I mean, from bus to train. We were going to have so much fun. I had scored various things, and we were going to go have fun, and the day before we leave, Big John brings me in, and my nickname from where I'm from is Chopper. Everybody still calls me Chopper from back home, and even my family, and, and he sits me down and goes, Chopper, I know what you guys are up to, and you get that little scared feeling. I'm like, no, you don't. We ain't up to nothing. We just going to go visit my dad, and he goes, boy, I know what you're doing with my son. And then the fear of God comes over you. Because Big John had one of them voices like God himself was talking to you. Chapa. He was OG, though. I totally respected him. Because one time I tried to slap box him, and he whooped me. And so I totally respect him. I was that kid. And I warn you, I said I was that kid. Still a funny joke to this day now. I, he lives right down the street from me now, Big John. And so anyway, long story short, he tells me something that I'll never forget. He says this. He goes, I need you to think about something. Where would you go if you died tonight? I'm like, really? I'm trying to go sin, and you want to hit me with some Jesus stuff? You are killing my vibe. So me, I don't want to say all that. I'm like, I don't know. And he goes, boy, God is watching you. You need to think about that. And then it's like a movie. He just turned around, and he disappeared. (laughs) And I'm not kidding you. We got on the Amtrak train, and we were doing some things we shouldn't be doing. And the whole time, I'm thinking, God is watching me. I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to go to hell. Man, I'm going to go to hell, man. You know what? You guys are going with me then. I ain't going alone. Shoot. Down in L.A. trying to party. Man, I couldn't even party right because all I could hear was Big John's voice. Where are you going if you die tonight, Chopper? Where are you going? And I'm like, man, I can't even sin right right now. Sinning, this ain't even fun no more. And then all of a sudden, we get home on Saturday. I didn't even know it was Easter Sunday morning. And then all of a sudden, I get up, I get myself dressed, I jump in the car, and I end up in church on the corner of Westland and Bianca in Stockton, California, Westland Four Square Church. I'm sitting where every good heathen sits. I'm sitting in the back, 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 back row. Back row. Last seat to the door just in case something pops off. That's weird. I could just dip out, right? I'm like, I'm gone. This dude came up in his all-white suit, Pastor Curtis Holland, big old rostrum, big old pulpit. And every time he would say a good point, he would kind of lean up like that. So I was back there making fun of him. What's that mean? All of a sudden, he gives this invitation. He says, if you're in here and you're sick and tired of being sick and tired and you're looking for a life change, Jesus wants to meet you where you're at. Raise your hand. Bam! Hand shot right up. I was like, what the heck are you doing? Out of all the times I needed to, you have failed me. (laughs) My hand is up in the air. And then he said some, I don't know if it scared heaven in or hell out of me. I don't know to this day. He said, if you mean business with God, I need you to get up from where you're at. This church sat 500 people. Easter Sunday morning, he goes, you need to walk yourself down here. 
I'm like, there's no way I'm walking down here for all these people. Next thing you know, from the back row, my feet, I get up and I start walking, looking like the tin man, just like, what the heck? Trying to fight it every step of the way. And who's at that altar? John Sales. Chapel. Told you God was going to get you. <laughs> I ain't never been back. I ain't never been back. I became a youth pastor a year later. That's stupid, by the way. That, I don't know what happened there. That, but I do not recommend that. I do not recommend that. I don't know how that even happened. I don't even know why they give me a mic to preach, but it happens, right? Kim Youth Pastor, and, and the story's been written. So check this out. I'm going to put a picture up on the board, and uh, I just want you to see this. This right here is my cousin. It's my cousin Sergio. And like a good young Mexican, he has two other names, Teto, Chingerlings. I mean, he just has lots of names. But uh, a few months ago, I got a phone call. I was at the gym, and I got a phone call. It's never good when your mom calls you at 6 in the morning. And on the other end, my mom was crying. And she said, me, I got to tell you something. Um, your Thea got a phone call a little bit ago, and your cousin's dead. His girlfriend went over to his apartment because he hadn't answered in a, I think she said it was like a day or whatever, close to a day. And he was dead in the bathroom. And at first we thought it was drugs because um, he had suffocated on his own vomit. And he had been in and out of prison, in and out of drug use, and it just, it was all bad. So I had to call my Thea, who's also my Nina. And I call her up, and she's just crying on the phone, and she's just, you know, hey, listen, your uncle, your Uncle Joe, they're not married, but still my Uncle Joe. Um, he wants to do a Catholic funeral, but I want you to say something, you know, we know you're the priest in the family. I'm not a priest, I'm a pastor, but that's a whole other story. But yes, Thea, I'll say something. So I get to the funeral, I see my cousins who I haven't seen in a long time. And it's just killing my Thea. Like, it's just so hard. And she leans over and she's just bawling. She goes, I never thought I'd bury my, my, my child. I thought they would bury me. And so I'm crying. She's crying. We're all crying. And come to find out, he didn't die of a drug overdose. He died of a very rare spinal meningitis that he picked up somewhere along the way. But when they said how he died, it, he literally did die on his own vomit. It was really brutal, very painful. It wasn't quick. So my Thea's all tore up about this, right? And so I'm here to tell you that heaven and hell do matter. And let me explain something to you. We've done a lot of funerals. And, and let me just say this. No one has ever once got up and said this. I'm so glad this person's in hell. And I know they're in hell looking up watching me. No one's ever said that. Everybody always wants to believe the person's in heaven. And so I'm sitting in the front, Pastor. I'm sitting in the front. And... It hits me because I'm getting ready to get up. I'm getting ready to get up and talk about my cousin, who I love, loved. It's just a special dude. And it hits me. And I can't stop the tears because I'm like, I don't know where he is. My wife wasn't able to go with me. It's my mom and my Thea, and they're sitting on the side of me. And I just start crying. I'm about to go up here and eulogize. Where he's at. I mean, as a pastor, trust me, there's part of me that's like, come on, God, you owe me one. Tell me he's in heaven like you owe me. Come on. And God don't owe me anything. It's just I'm desperate, okay? I don't know how you talk to God. I'm desperate. And I'm just crying. And I, I'm just, I, I get up there and I don't even know how I managed to do it, but I talk about my cousin and it's just rough. And finally, my, my mom comes up to me. She yanks on my arm and she goes, you know, we got to go. Like, it's just too much for your Nina right now. We got to go. Take us home. So I'm walking out to the car, and I'm saying goodbye to my other cousins and other family, and I'm just, I'm not right. You can feel it, you know, just my, my mom's not right. My Nina's not right. I'm not right. I'm just really tore up. And I'm like, God, like, this sucks. And I'm mad at myself because I should have sprinkled more. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just not right. And I'm almost to the car, like from here to where he is playing the keyboard. And this guy, his name is Larry. And I'm like, he goes, hey, pastor. And I look at this guy and I'm like, did you even go to the funeral? You don't look anything like my family. Like, 
you are the most out of place individual I've ever seen in my entire life. Okay, anyway, he says, yo, pastor. And I turn around and I'm thinking, I ain't got no time. You know what I'm saying? I got no time for people today. Like today, I'm not a pastor today. I'm just human. I'm just human. And he goes, I need to tell you something about your cousin. So I perk up. I turn around, my mom's there, my Nina's there. And he goes, um, I met your cousin about 10 years ago. We were both strung out. I found myself in an AA, and the first person I invited was your cousin. So I took him, and then I found this church that I started going to, so I brought your cousin. And a few years back, I took him up to a men's camp up in Sonora, Old Oak Ranch. And I was down at the altar when your cousin wanted to pray to receive Jesus Christ. He said, I prayed with him to receive Christ into his life as his Lord and Savior. I lost it. I said, I don't know who you are, but I love you. <laughs> I just love you. You know you lost it when you just like, you know, you just got snobber everywhere, ladies, your eyelashes off. You know what I'm saying? You're just like, ah! You got one just hanging out over there. Come back. And I'm just like, and then my, my mom, my Nina, everybody's crying. And it's like, he goes, now listen, I know your cousin wasn't, I know he wasn't perfect. But I want you to know every time he hit rock bottom, he called me. And I get in the car. And there's just a different mood now. Oh, there's a peace. There's a peace, y'all. I can't explain it. There's a peace in this car. And I felt the Holy Spirit say something to me that I'm going to leave you with. And here it is. The Lord said, I'm faithful to the promises. And it just hit me and it reminded me of what I told the Lord at 17. Anytime I get a chance to preach, I will preach the gospel like my family is sitting in the audience. Lord, I will stay faithful. I'll preach to your cousin as if it was my cousin. I'll preach to your mom as if it was my mom. I'll preach to your grandparents as if it was my grandparents. And God has remained faithful to me because he is faithful to his people. And today my cousin sits in eternity only to be reunited with me when I get there, church. This is the real deal. I'm here to ask you you, will you fulfill the great commission with me? Who is your five? Who is your five? Father, in the name of Jesus, we trust that you are doing something. With eyes closed and heads bowed, just real quickly, who is that five? Put your, moms, dads, put your hands on your heart if this is your child you're praying for today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray they come home. Father, I pray that they just get rid of their stubborn pride and they see that, God, you are so kind, you are so loving, that there's no life outside of you. Father, I pray for that person in this place today. Come and experience your own faith in Jesus, our King. Father, I thank you for what you